So welcome everyone to this month's EMBL ABR ARDC webinar, Unlocking the Secrets in Your DNA, the Dawn of Cloud Native Bioinformatics. My name's Christina Hall and I'm from Melbourne Bioinformatics, which is a node of EMBL ABR, and I'm your host for today. My colleague, Susanna Bacon from ARDC is behind the scenes co-hosting the webinar. But today, we're very pleased to have Associate Professor Denise Bauer speaking to us. Denise is CSIRO's Principal Research Scientist in Transformational Bioinformatics and an internationally recognised expert in machine learning and cloud-based genomics. Her achievements include developing open source machine learning cloud services that accelerate disease research and are currently being used by 10,000 researchers annually. Denise maintains an active speaking schedule and we were inspired to invite her to present a webinar after noticing she was a keynote speaker at the upcoming International Conference on Bioinformatics in Indonesia, where a team from Galaxy Australia and Galaxy International will also be heading soon. In this talk, Unlocking the Secrets in Your DNA, the Dawn of Cloud Native Bioinformatics, we're very pleased that Denise will offer an insider's view on cloud native bioinformatics. So over to Denise. Excellent, thank you, Christina. All right, so let's get started. So the main thing that I want to bring across today is that we are at the dawn of cloud native bioinformatics. But let's step us, um, back and have a look at the future of health. So the future of health, I think we are really at this, at this beautiful crossroad or at the cusp of something really amazing in that we were able to treat diseases that just a couple of years ago were seen as being not, not treatable at all. And more importantly, we're able to put the information into people's hands so they can make the decisions about their health themselves. Now, this is a bright future, but it's also a demanding future. Like as bioinformaticians, we're now required to produce workflows that are reproducible and compliant with standards. The data set sizes, as you probably have noticed, are ever increasing and the complex Dependent, interdependent algorithms um, really picking up the pace of what skill set is actually required of you. And in my opinion, this trend is only sustainable in the cloud. But before I substantiate that more, let's um, look at the outline of the talk today. So I wanted to introduce you to cloud computing, if you're not already aware of it. And I want to give you three story, or two stories that really highlight how we are using cloud computing and how things that were impossible just a couple of years ago are now possible with the sheer volume of compute or the power of compute that we have access to. So the first story is around reading the genome and how the genome is included in the clinical practice. And the other one is around writing the genome. So once we have identified something that is wrong with the genome, can we then change it in order to facilitate treatment? So with that, let's get started with cloud computing. Before we go there though, allow me to introduce CSIRO. So if you're not aware of who CSIRO is, we are Australia's government research agency. And at CSIRO, we're really passionate about translating research to products that people can use in their everyday lives. Probably the most famous product that we've developed is, of course, Wi-Fi, which is now used in 5 billion devices worldwide. But we also developed the vaccine for the Hendra virus, which is a virus that is more deadly than Ebola. And on a lighter note, we developed the Total Wellbeing Recipe book, which is now on the book bestseller list alongside Harry Potter and the Da Vinci Code. So I think from our perspective, we have a really nice balance between products that people enjoy and products that people need. I'm probably a little bit more on the need side with being part of the eHealth Research Centre. So the eHealth Research Centre is Australia's largest digital health initiative and it's worldwide unique in that we're covering the full value chain from basic science over large-scale substantiation studies and then all the way up to really demonstrating the economic impact our developments our products have had on the healthcare system. So with that, let's jump into genomics, which is the area that I'm passionate about. 
and clearly I'm not the only one passionate about it because Frost and Sullivan have estimated that by 2025, 50% of the world's population will have been sequenced. That means that in genomics, we are going to produce more data than in the traditional big data disciplines, Twitter, astronomy, and YouTube combined. Which letting that sink in is on one hand really exciting, but on the other hand, it's a very daunting process or prospect because as bioinformaticians, we're not necessarily be equipped at being thrust at the forefront of IT technology. Luckily though, the technology that is already in the cloud is going to help us achieve this singular goal that, we, that we've been given. And the five main cloud providers are listed here, which is AWS, Microsoft Azure, Alibaba Cloud, and Google Cloud Platforms, as well as Oracle Cloud. And we worked with four out of those already. So but what is cloud? So the way I think about cloud is that like an in-room entertainment system. You bring your iPad or your iPhone along in order to listen to the music that you like and that you curated using the hardware that is in the room. It's the same thing with the cloud. You're using the hardware that is in the cloud in order to run a virtual machine, for example, with the software that you curated and you wrote. Like an in-room entertainment system, you can use different different hardware in there. So for some of the music that you might like, you want to have a bit of an oomph with it and therefore you need to have a subwoofer, whereas other things you don't need that. It's the same thing with the cloud. Sometimes you use large amounts of compute, even specialized compute hardware like GPUs, whereas for other times you don't need that amount of compute available to you and you can scale that on demand in the cloud. So with that, let let me go to the first story of how we're using cloud computing in order to read the genome. And that I want to give on the example of the ALS project that we're involved with. So we're involved with the Project MINE, which is the largest single disease consortium in the world, looking at the underlying cause of ALS, which is the motor neuron disease that Stephen Hawking had, and you might be familiar with from the Ice Bucket Challenge. With that prominence, the sheer scale of this project is immense. They have 22,000 whole genomes, which means that we will be able to do groundbreaking research that also requires to use the latest in compute technology. And this is basically where we come in. But stepping back, how do we actually finding the molecular origin or the disease gene that drives ALS? So in theory, it's very trivial in that each line here represents a genome. We identify the differences in the genome, the mutations and SNPs and indels. And we have that for the cases, so the people with ALS and the controls, the healthy people. And trivially, we just find the differences where one region is enriched to be different in the cases compared to the controls. Now, clearly the way that I've set it up is that it's not that simple in reality. In fact, a complex multigenic disease like ALS is not going to be driven by one location. There will be multiple locations that influence the outcome in a variety of different ways that is not um, consistent between individuals. So therefore, multiple locations working together, that requires a more um, sophisticated approach than what a typical logistic regression approach would give us. And here, using machine learning and specifically random forest in order to achieve this. So the aim is to find drivers, yes, but also the modulating factor. So the, the thing that makes the background of an individual unique in order to activate or provide a resilience factor towards um, mutations. So this is a classic machine learning problem where you have in the um, Project Mind uh, case, we have 22,000 individuals. So these are our samples. And we have 80 million features, so the 2 million differences between each individual on average. Averages up, well, sums up for um, 22,000 individuals to about 80 million 
differences that we need to look at. And of course, each sample is annotated with the status of either having the disease or being healthy. And the aim is to find the features that are the most predictive for the disease outcome. But with one point, sorry, and all of this goes to 22,000 individuals times 80 million variants or features is 1.7 trillion data points. And 1.7 trillion data points is not a trivial um, volume of data to work with in the machine learning context. But luckily, there is Apache Spark that can help us with that task. So let me introduce Apache Spark by first um, bringing us on the same page by saying, well, we all know what desktop computers are, right? So they have a node with a couple of CPUs on it, and their main focus is small data or ad hoc analysis on your computer. The next step up from that are high performance compute facilities and clusters where you have specialized nodes that might have more CPUs and you have multiples of those nodes. The problem though is that the focus of these high performance compute clusters are compute intensive tasks. Therefore, the communication between nodes is not trivial. And if you want to have data that goes from one node to another, you need to write bespoke parallelization procedures in order to achieve that. Now with genomic data being data intensive, we regularly exceed them, say the memory of one node and would have to bring in multiple nodes in order to compute some of that. And high performance compute clusters are just not catered for that. Whereas Apache Spark is exactly in that pocket. The way I think about it is that it's dissolving the boundaries between the nodes because the communication between nodes is standardized and you can just use a library in order to achieve that. So therefore, we're using Apache Spark because genomic analysis, especially machine learning in that space, is data intensive. And we need multiple nodes to compute um, the iterative tasks that we want to achieve. That, we developed Variant Spark, the library um, that allows us to do GWAS style analysis, but looking at multiple regions of this high dimensional genomic space. And comparing it to other technologies that are out there, specifically Spark ML, Ranger in R, and um, C++ implementations and H2O, Variant Spark is better in terms of accuracy and in terms of speed compared to the other offerings that are out there. So in fact, you can analyze 3,000 individuals, 80 million variants in just 30 minutes. And really this, because we're using machine learning rather than logistic regression, it's also smarter in that it only requires 20% uh, of the initial data set sizes to reach a statistically significant value. And that is important if one sample can cost up to $1,000. Reducing the amount of samples you need by 80% is quite a significant cost saving. So with that, we are quite fortunate to have large-scale collaborators to testing out uh, variants that can help us moving it forward. So with that, I quickly wanted to show you uh, Variant Spark in action. So the easiest way to get involved with Variant Spark is through Databricks. And if you're not familiar with Databricks, it's basically a managed Spark cluster where you have a notebook style approach and it connects automatically to a Spark cluster in the background. And you don't have to manage um, the setup of that Spark cluster yourself. All you do is link it up to an account either on AWS or on Azure, and Databricks handles the connection for you. So with that, let me quit this and go to the notebook. So this is the, um, how the notebook looks like in um, Databricks. And here up there, you can connect a cluster that you want and then running the analysis. Now I've pre-run this. Not because it takes long, it takes about two minutes for this particular data set, but because it's easier to talk this through. So we have a toy example in there that mimics the way we think complex diseases work in that there are multiple locations in the genome that are contributing to the disease, but they're not contributing in the same way. So you see they're here weighted. 
and they're also not contributing linearly. So not all of it is additive, but some of it is multiplicative. And this is exactly how we think complex diseases work. So this notebook, and you can easily copy that to your own work environment, has a description in there what you need to do in order to set it up. You can load the data, and this toy data is already available for you to get going. We then just import that data and run it. And as you can see, we have here listed the different individuals from the 1000 Genomes Project. And it loads the labels. So these are the zero and one annotations of that disease or of the toy data set that we put together. And in fact, that toy data set, the zero and one, comes from that equation that I showed you earlier of how these four locations in the genome work together. There's some configurations required, a one-liner required of how many trees, since it's a machine learning method, you want to train, and off you go training. You can then get the results back by the variable importance. So these are all the locations in the genome that we uploaded, and to each location, variance bark assigns an important score of how likely this particular location is predictive or is involved in the phenotype that we observe. The nice thing with this notebook is that you can use multiple languages in order to then drill into the data. So for example, this is an SQL style analysis where you can pull out the top 25 locations in the genome that are associated with the disease. You can use Python doing the same thing, and you can use R doing the same thing. And ultimately, uh, the goal is to realize which areas in the genome are associated with the disease. So therefore, we also have the, um, our hipster toy data set. We also have a Manhattan-style analysis, which shows you exactly the locations in the genome. So each dot represents a location in the genome. And the higher the dot is on the, on the y-axis, the more associated it is with the disease. And as I was saying earlier, we picked out four locations in the genome, four traits that interact in order to build this complex disease, in quotes, which is our hipster data. So we have a location that um, influences monobrow, whether someone has fabulous hair or beard, um, whether they wear check shirts or coffee consumption. And all of this, we feel, um, produces the complex hipster data. So to reiterate that, what we've done is in order to demonstrate variance bark is able to handle complex nonlinear interactions in the genome and rediscovers them. We had the thousand genomes project. We assigned to each individual a score of zero and one, being a hipster or not, depending on that complex um, non-additive function that we put together earlier. And then we gave to variance bark only the genomic location as well as the zero one annotation, whether that person is a hipster or not, and let it go. And thankfully, otherwise I wouldn't show you this, it found those four locations to be the most important uh, properties going forward. So comparing this though with other approaches, for example, hail logistic regression, what we can see is that what I'm plotting here is Hale p-value versus variance bark. And as you can see, Hale has put out or has identified many more locations to be associated with the phenotype that are not real. And this is because logistic regression looks at each location independently, whereas variance bark look at, looks at the whole genome together in order to identify the locations that are important. With that, going back to the presentation, our main goal is to make variance bark as accessible to the research community as possible. So I showed you how it's accessible through Databricks. It's a similar way accessible through Terra, which is a similar concept as Databricks, except on Google Cloud platforms and specifically for the life science area. But it also is natively available on AWS and specifically through the marketplace, which is basically 
an app store like your iPhone or Android app store where you can subscribe to Varian Spark as a service. We maintain it in the background and all you do is use it. And with this, we do have um, a couple of big name partners who are already interested in using it. So with that, finding locations in the genome from the whole genome is interesting, but sometimes you do have additional information and it will be a crime not to use that additional information in order to prioritize variants to reduce down the search, search space and in, increase the accuracy um, of your results. So for that, we developed a methodology that can take ancestry information into account. So with ancestry information, we can identify areas that are shared between individuals. So it will be identity by descent. And those areas, of course, limit the amount of search space in the genome that you need to look at. Because if two individuals have it and they're related, it can only ever be in those locations um, that they share. The disease mutation can only ever be in the location that they share. So therefore, you can reduce down the search space drastically. And for that, we wrote tribes. And the important bit is that the further away the individual is from a relationship point of view, the higher the information gain would be. So ideally, you want to look at uh, information that are in the fifth or the seventh degree of separation in order to gain the most influence. And this is exactly where tribes shines. Compared to traditional data, for example, King um, is running on Plink, which has a, an accuracy drop from the third degree. So your great grandfather, your great your grandfather, it drops drastically, um, getting in the accurate information of degrees of relationship. Whereas tribes remains accurate until the seventh degree, which is really crucial for those disease gene discoveries. And we do have an example here where this has actually helped in the ALS context. So in the ALS, ALS, ALS context, we were able to bring in a new arm of a family history into this large family um, of ALS sufferers already. And through that, we were able to identify a novel shared variant, FIG4, which has a very compelling biological case, which is currently under review. So with that, you found your putative location in the genome that is causative, but how can you then share it with the world? Because clearly this is going to be important for other clinicians and other researchers to take into account when they do their, their analysis. And typically this is done through the Beacon network. But if you're not familiar with Beacon, Beacon is basically a exchange protocol that allows users, clinicians or researchers to ask, did you see allele T at this particular location on chromosome two in a specific cohort that is attached to the beacon? And the Elixir implementation of beacon would then go to a massive database that holds all the information of um, the genotypes that are shared and would return a yes, no, we've seen this particular mutation or not. And the relevance of that will be, for example, in this research where it's unlikely that a mutation that you've seen in another cohort is actually the causative mutation for a rare genetic disease that your patient might have. So being able to rule out and prioritize again variants um, is a massive component of rare disease research. Problem though is with the Elixir Beacon implementation, because it's traditional technology and consolidates all the information into one massive data set, it is also very resource um, intensive and the cost and time requirements we feel are just too high. So this definitely is no low hanging fruit. In fact, for the Genomes England cohort, we calculate that they would need $4,000 per month in order to maintain the system. Also, it will take them 33 hours in order to update their system for new information that comes in. And every time someone wants to query for that amount of data, it will take 20 seconds. 
in order to serve that particular query, which we feel going forward in real-time analysis where this is going to be used in the clinical system is not going to be sufficient. Again, we went back to the latest in cloud technology in order to find a solution that helps here, specifically serverless. So the way I think about serverless, again, starting on uh, with an on-prem server or a, a desktop compute, is that it's like you're owning your own car. You have full flexibility where you go and it's, you can make it very cost effective. Problem though is that with your own car, you need to take it to the service and it's not very scalable. Like the car that you have is the car that you have. If those are two requirements that you want to change and in this scenario, we do want to change it. Your option is, for example, going for a chauffeur. The chauffeur would take the car to the service and you can send the chauffeur away coming back with a pickup when you go to Ikea and accidentally pick up a couch that you bought. So therefore the equivalent here is cloud service with auto scaling. But like a chauffeur, auto scaling is very cost, uh, cost is very costly. And therefore in the bioinformatics space, this is not necessarily a viable option. But thankfully, there's something called serverless, which basically addresses all the issues that we have without the price tag. So this is equivalent, I feel, to ride sharing apps like Uber, for example, where you have multiple choice of what kind of car you want to have, and you certainly don't have to take care of the car. You still have full flexibility of going wherever and whenever you want. And it's very cost effective because there's just so many cars out there they can instantly recruit. And it's the same thing with serverless. Basically, what you do is you're recruiting CPUs and that's all you do. And you don't care about where they're running, how they're maintained, and how you get the right amount of CPUs at the right time. It just magically appears. Of course, there's no magic to it. There's, it's, it's a managed service by the cloud providers, but for all you care, you don't have to worry about this. So with this, using serverless, we were able to slash down the time in order to update the database from 33 hours, traditional data set, to just 22 seconds. We were able to slash down the price 300 fold from $4,000 to just $15 a month. So for less than a cup of coffee per day, you can offer this information that the causative mutation that you have in your cohort to the world. But I think the most exciting thing is that we're able to maintain runtime or keep it constant, irrespective of the data set sizes that we have. As you can see, for serverless, it basically takes a second, irrespective of the data set sizes. And this is specifically important for when we go from um, from a couple of thousand variants to millions of variants, so array data to whole genome sequencing data, which in the traditional way would have increased you know, substantial runtime, uh, yeah, substantial, um, substantial resource improvement or cost, whereas we keep it constant. So with that, our serverless beacon can handle the same workflow but it's um, query time is constant at one, sec, uh, one second and the update time is 20, 20 seconds, which is amazing. And also the cost is uh, drastically reduced. So again, we're very fortunate to have partners that are putting this into production and testing out the limits of this technology. But with serverless technology, the other thing that this allows is it's not only more affordable, agile, and faster, but it also allows the data to not be consolidated. And distributed data means that we have more fine-grained access or control over the access and the ownership. Therefore, the ownership is not coordinated by the provider anymore, but by the data owner. Also, it's in and innovation friendly because everything is modular and you can plug and play and do different things. 
So with that, we truly believe that once you go serverless, you never go back. The rapid prototyping is really helping us develop something small scale and then uh, on a smaller scale and then scaling it up to production without having to have a massive overhead in rewriting the code. Also, it allows burstable workloads, which means that we're not paying anything when it's not used, but it instantly can scale to workloads um, if multiple people are using it at the same time. And as I said, it's innovation friendly where innovation becomes affordable because everything is modular. So with that, it's not surprising that um, it's estimated that, that by 2025, it's going to be a $20 billion market. So saying that everything is serverless that we're going forward, this is another tool that is also serverless that we build in collaboration with our partners here, um, Melbourne Genomics and Queensland Genomics Health Alliance and QAMR, which brings genomic data and clinical data together in order to really empower decision support for clinicians. Now, being able to diagnose information in the genome is great, but ultimately we want to treat people. So if, how can we translate the insights from the genome to something actionable that, um, that represents a treatment? So coming back to the ALS example, there are mutations in SOD1 which cause a certain type of ALS. And silencing SOD1 slows down neuronal death. And this could potentially be a treatment avenue. The only problem is how do you actually silence SOD1 or how do you modify those misspellings in the genome? And for that, of course, we come to our second story, which is around how to write the genome. So I'm sure you've all heard of CRISPR, CRISPR technology and how it revolutionized medicine. So the concept here is that had, well, CRISPR, if you, if you haven't heard of it, CRISPR is a machinery that can go into the genome, edit a specific location in the living cells in the living genome in order to say correct misspellings. And the theory here of how to develop or how to deliver treatments will be that we package up the machinery in a capsule that knows how to target a certain cell type, in this particular case, neurons. It then would deliver the machinery to the neurons and the machinery would then go to the location in the genome where the misspelling is and would correct the misspelling. Now theory is great, practice is of course a bit more complicated. And the, why is it difficult? But my analogy is that basically finding the right location in the genome is like finding the right grain of sand on a beach. The machinery has certain properties that need to be fulfilled, which will be akin like finding the right grain of sand that has the right shape, the right size, and the right color. So you need to go to the, through the whole beach and have your bucket of candidate locations in the genome that you might be able to target. But you're not done there because clearly you want to avoid the machinery going to other locations that look similar. Therefore, you need to make sure that all your grains of sand are quite unique. Therefore, with your bucket of sand, you need to go through the whole beach again and make sure that every candidate is unique to any other locations in the genome. And as you can appreciate, that is quite compute intensive. So using serverless technology, we wrote a search engine for the genome where researchers can go into the genome, go to a specific location and say, I want to edit this particular gene. Give me all the candidates the target sites that are beneficial. And clearly with something precious as human samples, you want to target your resources to areas that are more, uh, that are more likely to result in an accurate um, experimental outcome. So with that, we wrote, um, wrote the search engine for the genome, CT scan, which improves accuracy by 30% compared to other state-of-the-art tools, and it reduces cost um, by 300 times. So again, fortunate to have partners 
but are using it in the practice and help us improve the technology. So how do we do that, reduce uh, the cost by 300, well, 99% uh, cost effective we want? So typically, the typical approaches using traditional servers would cost us $700 per month in order to offer this search engine to the genome, which is a cost that we would not be able to, to bear sustainably. But with serverless technology, we can bring it down to $2.50 per month in order to democratize the access to this high quality uh, analysis, safe analysis for finding the best target site in the genome. So with this, um, the, the technology is available on AWS. That's the first cloud provider that we targeted, but it's also available on Alibaba Cloud as well as Microsoft Azure. Now, I'm not going to go into the architecture. If you want to know more, there's a This Is My Architecture video, which goes into the detail. But I think what I want to show you here is how strikingly similar the architectures look across these different cloud providers. So therefore, multi-cloud deployment and multi-cloud collaboration is going to be something that is relevant for the future. We have technologies running on one cloud that is interacting with technologies running on another cloud, which I find personally quite exciting. So coming back to GTScan, the search engine for the genome. Sorry, it goes automatically. Um, so GTScan is the first offering that we had in that space, which finds unique target sites in any genome. So we currently have, I think, 30 or 40 genomes available on our, um, on our website. And if you're interested in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a genome that is not listed there, just get in touch with us and we can put it on there. We also have available Tuscan, which not only finds efficient target sites, but also target sites, sorry, not only unique target sites, but also efficient target sites. So target sites that have the highest probability of actually generating results. GTScan2 is, GTScan2 is uh, then the next step up of um, having locations in the genome that, um, where, where we have for different cell lines, but because for every different, for every cell line, there's a different chromatin environment, and therefore the properties of CRISPR interaction is slightly different. Therefore, GTScan2 is the way of um, doing, finding locations that are cell, cell, size, cell type specific. QN, of course, is um, a way of doing base editing or what we call nucleotide editing. So therefore, rather than base editing, where, which only targets certain bases. Nucleotide editing can target any base, and QN is the way to, to do that. And of course, VASCOT, which is a snippetware target finder, because for every CRISPR needs a specific location in the genome like that is called a PAM. And when a mutation is creating or destroying PAMs, then the target site can either uh, vanish or, or occur. Therefore, the differences between individuals, and this is what I'm showing here in this Venn diagram, where amongst three individuals and the reference, there are only 134 target sites the same, whereas the vast majority are unique to the individual genomes. Therefore, when we do precision medicine as a, as a treatment, we need to take the patient's unique SNP profile into account in order to achieve the best targets. So with that, the three things to remember is that the datafication of everything demands that white machine learning um, be handled correctly. And by that, I mean the genome, of course, is white. As I was saying, it's 80 million features per sample. But I would argue that other disciplines, proteomics, RNA-seq, <clears throat> will have a similar problem and that every sample is described by multiple thousands, millions of data points. And variance bark is not specific to genomic data analysis. It can be used for other disciplines as well. As long as you have 
features and an annotation with that feature. And the task is to identify which feature is associated with the annotation. Variant Spark might be the tool for you. Also, you can prioritize submit variants with using additional information. In this particular case, ancestry information, which will be tribes. And you can share the causative variants that you found using Beacon in a much more cost-effective and agile way than with the traditional Elixir implementation of Beacon. And finally, if you're into genome engineering, GT, the GT scan suit might, be, might have a tool for you in that space. Be that that you want to edit a specific nucleotide, be that that you want to have a um, population approach where you want to uh, target or want to have a target that is robust, robust in a larger population or a target that is robust for a specific individual, which would be mascot, for example, or you want to find the genomic target site in a very obscure um, species, the GT scan suit might be, might be uh, the right choice for you. So with that, let me thank you and open the floor for questions. So we really appreciate that. We've got a question here. Um, uh, it's with the serverless beacon work, the cost savings are very impressive. However, does all of the data need to be stored in whichever cloud you are using, be that AWS or Azure? For example, I've heard that data movement charges in and out of commercial clouds are often very expensive. So how do data movement costs add to the overall costs? That's a very good question. So usually the data ingress is relatively cheap, if not free. Um, the moving the data out of the cloud is where typically the cost occur. So therefore, going forward, this is a prediction, <laughs> is that I think most of the analysis will be done directly in the cloud, through one cloud provider or another. Therefore, I would predict that the data is already in the cloud, and therefore we're just hooking into the raw data, the raw VCF files per individual in order to share that information. Yeah, I'm, I'm forever fascinated at the diversity of backgrounds and approaches that we uh, have with our speakers um, who participate in bioinformatics. So it's something I didn't introduce you with at the beginning. Are you able to speak a little bit about how your, your path to your current career, to your current role? Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm an original bioinformatician in that my undergrad training was in bioinformatics. So, and, and the way that it was set up was that we were sitting in the actual courses with medical students, so anatomy, things like that, um, as well as the IT people and the chemists um, and of course biology. So therefore, while we would do one course with them, they would do 10 other courses, which really makes you quite humble and appreciative of the, you know, that you're just scratching the surface and that there's so much more to really fully understand that discipline. But it also gives you that nice overview of not the dumbed down or specialized um, version for bioinformatics, but the actual hardcore, real, um, non, no, no bullshit, get to the point um, causes. So that's, that's what I've done as an undergrad course. And then I came here to do my thesis work. So this was this um, Bachelor of Honours at UQ. Yeah, and from there, I really liked it here in Australia because unlike other areas in Australia, I think the research is so much more egalitarian. If you have a good idea and you can articulate that idea, people listen to you. And I really appreciate that a lot. So from there, doing um, bioinformatics as a, as a Bachelor of Honours and then computational biology, however you want to call it, as my PhD in machine learning and genomics as one of my postdocs at um, IMB, Institute for Molecular Biosciences. And then at QBI, I was part of the first uh, sequencing facility that uses um, back then high C sequencing, high C sequencing machines, 
I think it was the first high seq sequencer in Australia with a focus on RNA sequencing. Yeah, and then from there, I started with CSR as um, in the translational part of bioinformatics. So how we can use the academic insights that we have in order to make products that, that are used in the real world. Hmm. Great, thanks for that. I've got another question here about whether there are plans to collaborate with Elixir and Beacon to change their architecture to inc incorporate a more cloud first approach. Mm. Yes, so Elixir is part, well, it's associated with Genomes England. So therefore we'll leave it up to them to decide how they want to handle it, whether they want to help Elixir coming up with a different implementation that incorporates our concepts or whether they're going straight up for you know, our implementation and offer that as a marketplace set up. Um, we'll leave it up to them because they, they have clearly the better overview of what is demanded um, by the community, by the international community. Hmm. Wonderful. Oh, that's all we have time for today. So thank you very much, Denise, for, for joining us and thank you to the audience for joining us as well. Embol ADR would like to acknowledge funding from Bioplatforms Australia and the University of Melbourne and ARDC would like to acknowledge funding from NCRIS. As the webinar closes today, there'll be a short survey, so please take the minute that it takes to fill that in. Thanks again to everyone and goodbye. Thank you, bye.